Hello again. Welcome back to History 321. I am Dr. Ron Trailer, and this is lecture number 14. All right, let's continue talking about Louisiana um, during Reconstruction and in the years uh, shortly thereafter, shortly after Reconstruction uh, ends. Now, We have said that one of the major goals of the Democrats in Louisiana, as a matter of fact, the Democrats all across the South, but hey, this is Louisiana history, so let's concentrate on Louisiana. One of the major goals of Louisiana Democrats was to somehow control the black vote, which was legal, but not even legal. It was constitutional because both the 14th and the 15th Amendment uh, had said so. Remember, the 14th Amendment gave to the former slaves all of the rights of citizenship, and that, and of course, one of the rights of citizenship is the right to vote. And then the 15th Amendment, as just in case you didn't uh, catch that the 14th Amendment had given the right to vote, the 15th Amendment specifically said that uh, the, the right to vote cannot be taken away from you because of the color of your skin. Pretty clear. Nevertheless, you always know that something bad is probably going to happen after you use the word nevertheless. Nevertheless, white Democrats attempted to do just that, uh, to control the black vote uh, and to do it in every way possible, most of which was illegal and unconstitutional. Now, What we have said is that blacks continued to vote between the years 1876 and 1896. But we also said that these plans that were created by the whites to control the black vote, these plans uh, gradually, inexorably uh, began to take effect and the and the bottom line was that fewer and fewer, even though blacks could still vote, fewer and fewer blacks could vote. Now, let's talk about something that sounds like it's absolutely and totally unrelated to the black vote. <coughs> I promise you, it is related. It's just going to take us a while to get there. The South... The southern states and the western states, uh, and when I say western, I'm, I'm really talking about the Rocky Mountain states. Uh, those were uh, agricultural states. A lot of farming and a lot of, and a lot of ranching goes on in those areas of our country. Now, perhaps you have been exposed to uh, the idea of a protective tariff, it may be in another course. A protective tariff is a special tax that is put on goods that are brought into our country. In other words, they're imported into our country. Um, and uh, historically, these tariffs were designed simply to raise money for the country because the money that the tax generated would go into the national treasury. But as early as 1816, protective tariffs began to be created. And the purpose of a protective tariff uh, was, well, sure, they would raise money, and that money still went into the national treasury. But the real purpose of a protective tariff was to protect these baby industries that were beginning to grow in the United States by the year 1816. Now, and for decades after that, uh, the United States government, the Congress, uh, really concentrated on protecting, protecting our um, industries, protecting uh, manufacturing, things like that. And they pretty much ignored the farmers and the ranchers. The farmers and the ranchers 
uh, had been that part of the economy uh, that was here first. Remember, there was a time when all of our economy uh, consisted of farming and ranching, and we were good at it, and we were successful at it. And as a result, um, Congress began to ignore the farmers and the ranchers. But what happens is the farmers and the ranchers uh, need help. Remember that uh, the farmers and the ranchers, they are at the mercy of, uh, of other people, of markets who determine what the price of a bushel of wheat is or uh, who determine the price of a bale of cotton or uh, determine what the uh, cost of any commodity is, you know, a pound of beef. Uh, the, the farmers and the ranchers who produced the item had really no say in how much it was going to cost and how much they were going to get out of it to put into their pocket. So they were at the mercy of faceless economic forces. It was called the invisible hand. Right? Now, something else that farmers and ranchers were at the mercy of, and that was uh, Mother Nature. Uh, farmers and ranchers had no control over droughts, for example, or perhaps floods, or uh, plagues of locusts, or uh, a strong wind that would knock down every stalk of corn or every blade of wheat. So, not only were farmers and ranchers at the mercies of the invisible hand, they were also uh, at the mercy of acts of God, if you will. And over the years, especially after the end of the Civil War, farmers and ranchers uh, attempted to find help from both political parties, from both the Democrats and the Republicans. And neither party was willing to help. They were more than willing to continue to help the manufacturing sector, right? Factories. But they pretty much ignored farmers. And ranchers, both parties, equally guilty. Now, it finally got to the point where farmers and ranchers began to organize themselves. Um, think of it as an early form of a labor union, except that it was not for people who labored in a mill or in a factory, uh, it was a union for people who labored on farms and ranches. Many of the people, many of the farmers and ranchers uh, who became members of these early farm and ranch unions, uh, many of them, uh, those, uh, there were several organizations that came and went, they would come into existence, they would exist for a while, uh, and they would die. Well, in the early 1890s, a, an organization came into existence that was called the People's Party. Um, we very seldom call it that. Uh, because that sounds too much like communists, right? The People's Party, uh, uh, the Democratic People's Party of North Korea, something like that. Right? What we know it more familiar, familiarly as is the Popular Party. The Populist Party, the People's Party, the People's Party. Oh, I've been on this, uh, I've been recording these lectures way too long, I can't speak anymore. The People's Party, the Populist Party is the same thing. Uh, and so, basically what happens in America is that the farmers and the ranchers give up on ever getting any res help, any response from either of the major parties. And so they create their own political party, the Populist Party. Now, in Louisiana, uh, the Populist Party... And, and across the South as well, but once again, we're talking about Louisiana here, aren't we? In Louisiana, 
uh, the populists had a uh, now remember that racism was still a serious problem in America. It still today is a serious problem in America. Especially in the South was racism common. White Southerners wanted nothing to do with organizing along with black Southerners, even if it meant help. That's how strongly uh, whites uh, discouraged uh, black participation in areas where they both needed help. Now, remember, most blacks by, eight, by 1890, they are farmers. And the populists are composed of small farmers. So that means that there are a lot of uh, poor black farmers and poor white farmers uh, who are members of the populist party. But they are divided. There's a, a black part of the populist party and there's a white part of the populist party. But the populists themselves come to the realization that this division is not helping them. As a matter of fact, it's hurting them. And what they, some populists began to begin to suggest that white farmers and ranchers and black farmers and ranchers put aside their differences, put aside their difficulties, and work for a, a common goal that they should re, that they should unite. Now. There were so many poor white farmers and poor black farmers that if they ever came together and agreed to work together, it would create a really powerful political party. And some Democrats, uh, remember who's controlling the politics of the South at this time? It's the Southern white Democrats. Those people were not stupid. They might have been racist, but they were not stupid. And they looked at what was happening in a small way, and they sort of envisioned a day when all small black farmers and all small white farmers would unite. And the, the result, if you were a white Democrat, was frightening. Because the Populist Party, if that happened, the Populist Party would have enough votes to defeat. Uh, the Democrats or the Republicans. And so, um, in Louisiana, it really became important, even more important than it ever had. Remember, it had always been the goal of the Democrats to um, uh, control black voting. But now it becomes critical because in the past, it's only been a theory. Now, there's a real chance that this is going to become reality. And so white Democrats uh, begin the next stage of uh, controlling uh, the black vote. And there were certain tools that were used all over the South to accomplish this. And we're going to talk about a couple of them. We're not going to go into detail on all of them. But let's talk about some of the more important ones. One was something called a grandfather clause. C-L-A-U-S-E. Not Santa Claus. <laughs> the grandfather clause. And what the grandfather clause said is that you could only vote if your grandfather had been able to vote in 1860. Now think about that for a moment. Who, whose grandfather could vote in 1860 in the South? It was a white, democratic man. The grandfathers, the grandfather clauses, when they were passed by certain southern states, automatically then took the vote away from all blacks, didn't it? Because no blacks could vote in the South, or very few could vote in the South in 1860, because most blacks in the South in 1860 were slaves, and slaves certainly couldn't vote. So the grandfather clause was a tool that was used to 
control, and I put that in error <laughs> quotes, basically his goal was to do away, and not to control, but to do away with the black vote. Um, something else that was used uh, to control the black vote, and those were literacy tests. State legislatures, southern state legislatures, would pass laws that said, uh, you can vote, but only if you can prove that you're for, that you're literate, that you can read, that you can write, um, and uh, some states went even further. You could ask, you could answer certain questions about uh, our government. So this is the way it worked: um, a black guy and a white guy walk into the polling place, um, and the uh, the voting official there says to the white guy, okay, you need to sign in. You need to sign your signature uh, before you can vote. And the white guy then signs his name. And he's permitted to vote. Uh, then the black guy steps up and the official says the same thing. Sign your name. And the black guy says, I don't know how to read or write. And the official says, well, I'm very sorry, uh, but only those who are literate can vote. And you're not literate, so you can't vote. So the literacy tests were used as a tool to keep blacks from voting. And there were variations of it, for example. Uh, and, they were, uh, and they were designed to be racist. The white guy comes in. And the election official says, uh, okay, you need to answer a question about American government. Uh, and they would ask the white guy a uh, simple question. They would say, uh, who's the president of the United States? Or who's the governor of Louisiana? Well, come on. They got an answer. Oh, okay, you can vote. What did they ask the black guy? Uh, quote the preamble to the United States Constitution, right? Um, well, you can't really, well, I'm so sorry, but you can't vote either. So the, so these tests were used as tools to deprive, uh, blacks of the right to vote. The most common tool that was used though, was something called the poll tax. That's P O L L poll tax. Um, and basically the poll tax was a uh, meant that you had to pay for the right to vote. Okay, and this is the way it worked. Um, the poll tax never was uh, a lot of money. It was 50 cents, 75 cents, maybe a dollar. All right? Uh, but, uh, so, you would, uh, by a deadline, which normally was sometime in the springtime, you had to go to the local courthouse, and you had to pay your poll tax. Now, when you paid your poll tax, they would give you a receipt showing that you had paid the poll tax, uh, and you were to keep that receipt uh, until election time rolled around, and when you showed up to vote, you would show them that you had paid your poll tax, and you would be permitted to vote. The problem was that many poor people literally couldn't afford to pay the 50 cent poll tax. I mean, they literally didn't have two nickels to rub together, as my grandfather would say. And they were unable to pay the poll tax, even though it was a low tax. And what does that mean when elections roll around? They can't show a receipt because they were unable to pay it. Therefore, they cannot vote. So, uh, and there were variations of the poll tax. There were variations of the literacy laws. There were variations of the grandfather clauses. But the thing that they all had in common was their purpose was to control black voting. And can we go ahead and just tell the truth here? Their real purpose was to prevent black citizens from voting. These laws were put into place gradually over the years after Reconstruction ended. Um, and that explains what I've already said several times. Blacks could, blacks continued 
to be able to vote in the years between 1876 and 1896. But we said that fewer and fewer of them, fewer and fewer of them were permitted to vote. And they were, and that is because these types of laws were put into place. Now, when the Democrats realized that there might be a possibility that poor whites and poor blacks who were members of the populist party very well, there might be more of them than there were of the Democrats or the Republicans, they really began at that point to make a special effort to take the vote away from the remaining blacks who still had the vote. Because there were some blacks who could, uh, for example, in your state, if you had a poll tax, some blacks were able to afford paying the poll tax. Some blacks were uh, educated enough to where they could pass the literacy requirements. So what, what to do about them? <laughs> well, let's create more laws that are even more restricted. By the year 1898, uh, the job of disfranchising Southern blacks was almost complete. Um, Louisiana, for example, and we'll talk about this when we get to it. Louisiana wrote a new constitution in uh, 1898. And in that constitution, uh, that constitution contained uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will. Uh, the constitution of, eight, of 1898 pretty much completed the task of taking the vote away from black uh, Louisianians. All right. Let's get back to the topic of the, uh, the Democrats in power in Louisiana. Uh, those people that some called the Bourbons and some called the Redeemers. They were all conservative. <coughs> um, they were no more or less honest than the Reconstruction Republican governors. Uh, for example, one state treasurer, a Democrat, after Reconstruction, a Democratic state treasurer by the name of E.A. Burke, B-U-R-K-E, stole more than a million dollars in state funds and ran away to Central America where he lived like a king for the rest of his life. Now, the best of these Democratic governors um, was probably a man by the name of Francis Nichols, Francis T. Nichols, N-I-C-H-O-L-S. And yes, uh, that is the man after whom Nichols State University in Thibodeau is named. Uh, most of you are too young to remember this, but Louisiana recently had um, a governor whose name was Mike Foster, right? Um, in the 1990s, Mike Foster, Mike Foster's grandfather was a man by the name of Murphy Foster. And he also served as governor in uh, the 1890s. As a matter of fact, Murphy Foster, the grandfather of Mike Foster, was the man who was the governor of Louisiana when the Constitution of 1898 that finished the disfranchisement of black Louisianians was created. Oops. All right. So let's get back and, uh, and start talking. We have already discussed three state constitutions in this class. We've talked about the Constitution of 1812, right? Um, and then 1830, whatever the heck that was, <laughs> and then the Constitution of 1845. There were others, and so let's talk about them. Um, a Constitution was written 
in 1868, uh, and that constitution was written by Republican Reconstruction Republicans. Um, and it very specifically gave the equal rights of citizenship to black Louisianians. And it should not surprise you that that constitution was despised by most white Louisianians. Now, the Constitution of 1868, which was written squarely in the middle of Reconstruction, was replaced after Reconstruction ended, it was replaced in the year 1879. Um, and it pretty much was written by the Redeemers, by the Bourbons, by the, the Democrats who had come back into power. And it was a very confusing document. It had more than 260 articles in it. Um, and it was confusing, and it was... Uh, um, uh, one part would disagree with another part. I mean, it was just really, really confusing. But the problem, of course, is that that Constitution, written in, seven, in 1879, remained in effect for almost 20 years until the Constitution of 1898 was uh, written and ratified. And remember, I said that that's the Constitution that almost completely disenfranchised black Louisianians. Now, the Constitution of 1898 was confusing in its own right. It reduced, it disfranchised black blacks who normally would have qualified to vote. By the way, the Constitution of 1898 was an equal opportunity hater because not only did it disfranchise black voters, it also disfranchised poor white voters. Why? Because black voters, by their very nature, are poor, and poor white voters were the very people that the Democratic Party was so afraid of. They were afraid that if the poor, that the poor blacks and the poor whites got together, they could run the show. And so how do you solve that problem? Well, you disfranchise both the blacks and the poor whites. And it was done by the use mostly of the poll tax and the literacy tests. The Constitution of 1898 reduced the number of black voters to almost zero. It reduced the number of poor white voters by almost a quarter as well. So it wasn't as bad on white voters, but it, but it nevertheless was, uh, it was, uh, it was damaging to the number of whites who could vote. Now, the Constitution of 1898 also did other things that were not really related to race. But we need to talk about those too. It prohibited the governor and the state treasurer from uh, succeeding themselves. In other words, you could you could serve for one term, and then you had to leave office. Um, and the real reason for this, one of the reasons for this, is to make sure that if you were a scoundrel and a crook and a robber and corrupt, you could you it, look, you better go ahead and steal what you can in four years because you're not going to get another term, right? <laughs> the Constitution of 1898 also gave new power to uh, parish and local governments. And it enlarged the court system. It created new courts uh, for the state of Louisiana. So while we're on the subject, I mentioned parish and local governments. Let's talk about parish and local governments in Louisiana uh, in the years after the Civil War. What we said was that most parishes uh, had remained under, under the control of local whites even during Reconstruction. 
And those parishes that were not under the control of local whites, once Reconstruction ended, those parishes came under the control of local whites. Now, what were the priorities of um, local governments, local and parish governments? Well, we've mentioned some of these, and so none of this is going to surprise you. Uh, the repair of parish buildings and municipal buildings that had fallen into disrepair uh, or had been damaged by the federal troops during the Civil War, uh, those needed to be repaired. Um, reconstructing, and I hate to use that word, but that's a good word, reconstructing the damaged records. Many of the records of the state of Louisiana and the individual parishes and the individual towns had been damaged or lost during the Civil War. And so especially the record, the land books, the books that literally registered who owned what land, many of those had been lost or damaged. Or destroyed. And so, uh, the state of Louisiana literally asks its citizens for help in reconstructing those records. For example, uh, a property owner who had paid his taxes would have a receipt, wouldn't he? For when he, for when he paid the tax and how much the tax was. And it also would include a legal description of that property. So, uh, landowners were asked to bring those receipts down to the parish courthouse uh, where they would be used to reconstruct the parish uh, property ownership records. Now, new parishes were also created uh, during um, and after Reconstruction. Now, I'm not going to ask you to remember, to, I'm not going to ask you about this on the test. I'm going to give it to you, though, so you will know that there were a lot of changes taking place in Louisiana during and after Reconstruction. For example, in 1868, Iberia and Richland parishes are created. In 1869, Tanchefahoe and Grant parishes are created. 1870, Cameron over in southwest Louisiana. Uh, 1871, Vernon, Webster, and Red River parishes are created. In 1873, Lincoln County. 1877, East and West Carroll are created. 1888, Acadia. 1908, LaSalle. 1910, Evangeline. 1912, Beauregard and Jefferson Davis. Traffic laws <laughs> were created in Louisiana uh, uh, after the appearance of automobiles in the very late 19th century. Uh, you didn't need a paved road uh, if you were in a horse and a buggy, but boy, you better have a paved road if you're in an automobile because those rutted and potholed uh, uh, roads will tear the suspension of an automobile to shreds. And so um, traffic laws would be created in the very late 18th, uh, I'm sorry, the very late 1800s and the very early 1900s. Uh, it, it's humorous to us, uh, but it was very serious back then. The maximum speed on straight roads was 15 miles per hour. <laughs> uh, if you were driving in a curve, however, the speed limit on the curves was eight miles an hour. And if you were crossing a bridge, you had to slow down to four miles an hour, or if you were passing a wagon, or if you were passing a buggy with a rider, or you were in front of a church, you had to slow down to four miles per hour. And cars were registered, but they were, you know, today we re we have a state registration. No, not then. Uh, the cars were registered in the uh, parish 
of the person who owned the vehicle. Law and order was almost non-existent in Louisiana. It was a violent place. Uh, it was characterized by murder. It was characterized by lynching. Now, lynching. Many of you are convinced that lynching is simply, well, it's not simple, but it consists only of hanging somebody. You know, a white guy or a white mob hanging a black man. And it's true that hanging someone is lynching. But uh, hanging is not the only, word, only way that you can be lynched. Uh, a lot of people, well, uh, there are other ways to be lynched. Uh, some people were literally, literally burned at the stake, burned alive. At the stake. You know, you think that goes out with Joan of Arc, but oh, no, 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 no. In the 19th and into the 20th century, people are still being burned alive in Louisiana. Um, in Texas, I lived in Texas for almost 30 years. Uh, there's a town over in East Texas called Vider, V I D O R. Uh, and in Vider, Texas, back in the late 1990s, not the 1890s, the 1990s, a black man who had made some white guys unhappy about something. They took chains and they tied him to the bumper of a car and they dragged him down the street while he was alive until literally his body fell apart. So, murder and lynching, lynching were rather common. Um, here in Tanshpo Parish, uh, murder was so common in Tashpo Parish that we got a new nickname. It was called Bloody Tashpo. And if you want to know more about that, I suggest that you take one of Dr. Sam Hyde's classes. Dr. Hyde is the acknowledged, one of the acknowledged experts on Louisiana history, and especially the history of the Florida parishes, which means that he is he's from the town of Amit here in Tashpaho Parish. And so he is an inexhaustible source of information about all of these things that we're talking about, especially with, uh, how they relate to uh, the Florida parishes and specifically to Tashpaho Parish. Now, there were more murders per capita. In other words, there were more murders per 1,000 people in Tashpaho Parish than there were in New York City. Especially violent was the city of New Orleans. It was a city open to crime and open to immorality. Um, there were certain portions of New Orleans that were uh, officially set aside for prostitution. It was called Storyville. Uh, and it would be in Storyville where much of the early developing jazz would come into existence uh, from uh, black and white, but mostly black musicians playing in these, well, I'll just call it what it is, these whorehouses, okay? <laughs> After the Civil War, uh, many uh, Sicilians settled in New Orleans, uh, and they brought the mafia with them. Now, that's not a popular thing to say these days. Uh, but once again, you are entitled to your opinions, but you are not entitled to your own facts. And that is a fact. Now, there was very little funding in Louisiana for the, what we consider to be very important things today. For example, there was very little funding for education. Now, during Reconstruction, the United States government had sent teachers all over the South, including Louisiana, and they their purpose was to teach, to educate the black children. Um, and the organization for whom they worked was called the Freedmen's Bureau. And the, and the Freedmen's Bureau established many, many, many schools across the South. 
Little black children went to school. And oddly enough, uh, their parents would go to school too because their parents understood that it was important to uh, educate their children, but they also understood that it was important to educate themselves. So many black adults learned to read and write uh, going to these Freedmen's schools, Freedmen's Bureau schools. Now, uh, but once the once Reconstruction ended, excuse me. Once Reconstruction ends, the Freedmen's Bureau also pretty much. And after that, it's up to Louisiana to educate its own people. Uh, and there simply is not enough money. Uh, remember we said a lecture or so ago that uh, in some years, as much as half of the Louisiana uh, budget would go simply to buy prosthetic arms and legs for people who had lost arms and legs during the Civil War. There was no money um, for education. Now, the, we had a Department of Education, we had a Board of Education, a State Board, uh, and we even had a director, a superintendent of education, but there was no money, which means that it only existed on paper. Uh, in Louisiana, the children who were being educated were being educated um, at private schools. Uh, they would go to the local Catholic school. Um, those of you who are from New Orleans know about the Ursulines Academy uh, there in New Orleans. Uh, the oldest uh, continuously existing school in the United States. If you didn't send your child to a private school, uh, then if you had the funds, uh, you would hire a tutor to come in to teach your children. But the answer to the question, were, common, were public schools common? The answer is no, not yet. Someday, but not yet. There was, a, there was little funding for other people who desperately needed help. For example, the deaf, the mute, the blind. Today, we have schools that exist for the purpose of providing help, providing an education for uh, the deaf, the mute, and the blind. Uh, but none of those existed in Louisiana at the time, uh, not at the state level. What help was given those people uh, came from parish government or from private donations. There was no state help for the aged because there was no such thing as Social Security. There was no Social Security at the national level. And there certainly was no social security at the state and parish and local level. There was no state help for the unemployed. Today, if we lose our job, we can apply for unemployment benefits. That did not exist during that time. The state did have asylums for the insane. but. You didn't want to be sent to one because the conditions were literally abominations. Uh, there were asylums at Jackson and there was an asylum near New Orleans. Uh, there was no medical treatment for the, uh, for the patients. In fact, they weren't really considered to be patients. They were considered to be inmates. Uh, there was no medical treatment, no shoes. They often literally were naked uh, and they slept in unheated buildings as late as 1888. Now, folks, I know we live in the deep south, but you also know how bitterly cold it can get here sometimes in the winter. Now, sleeping naked in an unheated building. Some of the insane were actually mainstreamed, in other words, they were included, they were sent to uh, jails and prisons where they were mixed into the criminal uh, population of those, uh, of those prisons. Honestly, though, uh, 
they probably were better treated there than they were at the insane asylum. Um, Charity Hospital in New Orleans was eventually created. Um, as many as 17,000 patients a year ran through uh, charity, what we call big charity, right? <laughs> uh, in the year 1914, for example, at a total cost of $300,000. And that was 17, you do the math, that was $17.65 per patient. You can't do much to heal anybody with $17.65 per patient. Now, we've mentioned prisons in passing, but let's let's zero in on prisons in Louisiana. Before the Civil War, uh, with regard to the slaves, if a slave uh, broke a law, the master punished the slave. Uh, especially if it was a minor law or a trivial law, law, uh, the master was responsible for punishing the slave. Only if it was uh, like a slave murdering a white man or a white woman or a white period uh, did the state take over and prosecute the slave. After the war, though, there was no slavery uh, and there were no masters. Uh, the former slaves had all the rights of citizenship on paper. Um, and so freedmen were arrested and tried and convicted. The thing about it, though, was that it was an unequal justice. Um, the same laws were applied to whites and blacks. But the penalties for being convicted of the same crime quite often were different. Um, blacks were convicted more often than whites after being accused of the same crimes. And when whites and blacks were convicted of the same crime, the chances were overwhelming that the black person would receive a much more severe sentence than the white guy. Now, prisons proved to be really, really expensive. And let's get back to the idea that Louisiana was bankrupt after the end of the Civil War. And yet the prison, the prison population is expanding because now there are black prisoners and because the blacks are being treated unfairly, there are more blacks than there are whites. So to avoid the expense of having to build new prisons, the state of Louisiana <clears throat> began to lease convicts to private companies and private individuals. Now, uh, this private contractor uh, would promise to uh, give the convict uh, adequate food, adequate clothing, adequate shelter, um, and would treat them humanely as they put them to work. But that never happened. The reality is that, um, that what happens is the white convicts stay in the prison, while the black convicts are sent out to work for these private contractors in these um, convict camps. Um, and the work that they're expected to do is uh, the most difficult, the most dangerous. They are out there uh, clearing rights of way so that the train through the swamp, <laughs> so the train, the railroad can come through. Or they're out there uh, strengthening the levee in the swamp. Or they're digging drainage dish ditches uh, in the swamp. There was a high mortality rate high mortality rate. It was almost a death sentence. It was almost as dangerous as it had been to be a sugarcane slave back when slavery existed. That was the most dangerous type of slavery, to be a slave on a sugar plantation. Being a leased convict 
was almost as dangerous as that. Uh, and so, uh, and the people who, uh, because they were, they were so dangerous, there was a high mortality rate. A lot of these poor devils died. And they were literally worked to death. But it was even worse than that. Uh, if they disobeyed the foreman who was out there, uh, the equivalent of the old slave driver, uh, if he made them, if he, if they made him mad, he'd just shoot them and bury them in the levee. And what was done about it? Nothing. Uh, well, actually, something was done. They would simply order another black convict <laughs> and bring him out and uh, use him to replace the one that was now buried in the levee. Because they didn't have to explain the deaths to the states. All they would say was that he died. The average convict who was leased from the state of Louisiana by these private contractors, their life expectancy was about seven years, and that was almost the same life expectancy as a sugar slave on a sugar plantation. It was a great deal for the contractors because they got literally to work these poor people to death, and then they'd just go get a replacement. It was a good deal for the state because the state didn't have to worry about clothing or feeding or sheltering or protecting these convicts. The only people that it was a bad deal for, and it wasn't it wasn't even a bad deal for the con for the convicts. It was a deadly deal for the convicts. Now, over the years, Hollywood has loved, you know, you know that I take pleasure in uh, trashing the uh, historical uh, accuracy of movies that are made in Hollywood. One of the most famous movies ever was a movie called Cool Hand Luke. It was a Paul Newman movie. And in the movie, Paul Newman was a leased convict uh, in a prison camp uh, in a southern state. I don't honestly remember if they even mentioned what the southern state was. And as far as it went, it was a rather accurate portrayal. It, it talked about uh, the brutality that these men had to live under. But it misses one of the main points of the convict leasing system. If you go to Netflix and rent uh, Cool Hand Luke, uh, especially after you see this lecture, you'll realize that the discrepancy there is a glaring one. Every one of those men in that prison camp is white. <laughs> and the reality is that most of the men in uh, these labor camps was black. Now, let me repeat something that I've already said, because it's it's extraordinarily important. Blacks, blacks were politically active until the 1890s, even though it was in lessening and lessening and lessening amounts. Blacks were almost totally disenfranchised by the 1898 Louisiana Constitution. One quarter of poor whites were also disfranchised by that same 1898 constitution. So fundamentally what I'm telling you is that neither group, poor blacks or poor whites, but mostly poor blacks, uh, had a voice in the social or the economic life of Louisiana. And of course, something that happens in 1896 makes all of this even worse because the Plessy, P-L-E-S-S-Y, the Plessy versus Ferguson, F-E-R-G-U-S-O-N, the Supreme Court in 1896 comes down with the Plessis, Plessy versus Ferguson decision. Now, let's talk about that in the few minutes that we have left on this lecture. What we have said was that uh, starting with the end of 
uh, reconstruction that slowly, slowly, but surely Southern states began to restrict the civil rights of their black citizens. And of course, it happens in Louisiana. For example, Louisiana, by 1890, passes a law that says that blacks and whites cannot travel together in the same railroad car or in the same streetcar. There has to be a whites-only car and a blacks-only car, and you cannot mix the races on the cars. Well, there was an organization already in existence then that still exists today. It's called the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. The American Civil Liberties Union uh, wanted to challenge that Louisiana law that, put, that created the all-white and the all-black cars. And so they decided to create what was called a test case. And here's the way it worked. There was a very light-skinned black guy in New Orleans whose name was Homer Plessy. That's where the Plessy versus Ferguson comes from. Homer Plessy was a very light-skinned black guy. And so one, and he was chosen uh, to, uh, to be the test case. So one day, Homer Plessy buys a ticket. He gets on the white railroad car in New Orleans, and he's traveling over to Slidell. He's so white that nobody realizes that he has black blood. And so he has to announce it. He stands up and says, hey, my name is Homer Plessy and I'm a black guy. What do you think about that? Huh? Well, what they think is once he admits that he's black, they kick him off the train. Which is exactly what the ACLU and Homer Plessy wanted to happen. Because they sue the state of Louisiana for, the, for that law. Um, and that case works its way, and they know the ACLU is convinced that the uh, court system will recognize how unfair this black car, white car deal is. And so they are just waiting for it to get to the Supreme Court because they are convinced that the Supreme Court will say, that is so wrong, that is unconstitutional, you can't do that. But when it gets to the Supreme Court, guess what? The Supreme Court rules in favor of the state of Louisiana and against Homer Plessy. As a matter of fact, what the U.S. Supreme Court says is um, that a black man has no rights that a white man is obligated to honor. Wow. Now, you would think that the Supreme Court would have read the Constitution, right? What does the Constitution in the 14th Amendment do? It gives equal civil rights to black Americans. It gives them citizenship, and it gives them equal rights. And yet, the Supreme Court in 1896, you know, just 30 years or later or so, uh, they backtrack on that whole idea of uh, civil equality. And as a result of Plessy versus Ferguson, everything in the South becomes divided by race. Um, separate schools, uh, white and black drinking fountains, um, a black section in the theaters, black and white sections in the theaters. Um, uh, blacks can't come into a restaurant if there are white people in there. Um, I remember those days. I was a child of, um, of Jim Crow. And I remember, um, uh, going to the Hi Ho, which still exists. Remember that barbecue sandwich place here in Hamlin? That's an old place. It's been here forever. I would go to the Hi Ho and I'd be sitting inside eating my barbecue sandwich and a black guy, my guy ordered a sandwich. He could get it. They would sell him a sandwich. But he had to go around to an early a version of a drive through He couldn't come inside. He had to make his order outside and wait for it 
outside, and it didn't matter what the weather was. And that ruling, Plessy versus Ferguson, would remain in existence until the same Supreme Court that created Plessy Ferguson would overrule itself with Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. But even after the Supreme Court reversed Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, that racism remained in effect all over the South. As a matter of fact, there are some there are some school districts in Louisiana that still have not obeyed totally obeyed the terms of Brown versus Board of Education. Okay, that's almost a minute. It's almost an an hour and a minute. So we're going to stop there. That's a good place to stop, um, and we will. We will pick up with a continuing discussion of Reconstruction. All right. I'll see you soon.